Friends and enemies, welcome to the three-year anniversary episode of the Canadian Bitcoiners podcast here on the CBP Media Network. Len, I got to be honest with you, I forgot until I saw it in the thumbnail that we had done three years. So just before we went on, I said, happy three years. I'll say it again. You know, we've, we've done a good job. You are now, you got to be close to my second longest, you know, serious relationship here, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I'm married now, so I don't think anyone else is going to pass you. I have, do you? <laughs> do you feel any kind of way about that? I don't know. What do you think? Why am I number two? I thought I was number one. <laughs> <laughs> no, only, I'll be happy to play second fiddle here. Only in terms of length, okay? Only in terms of length. I won't talk about that. <laughs> no, in this case, I'll be happy to be second fiddle. It's very good that somebody else is ahead of me and somebody that's very near and dear to your heart. But yeah, I think three years, this has been phenomenal. And you know that, I'll be honest, I'm sorry to say this. I kind of forgot until the <laughs> message came in. It's like, oh yeah, you're right. Uh, so... <sighs> Yeah, so it's going to be a regular old episode. Yeah. Three years of doing this. It's going to be a lot of fun. This one, a lot of talk about both on the home front and what's going on globally, Bitcoin and uh, notable news. But Tons, enjoy. lots of notable news tonight. Yeah, it's. I think it's time to talk about, well, we have the scheduling first. I think it's a, before we even go anywhere. Let's sure, quickly, yeah. Before okay. we go to the sponsors, Bob Burnett, because people that are unaware is going to be coming in this Wednesday. I'll be chatting with him. There's lots of... Lots that happened since he's last been on the show, and I'll be happy to catch up with him. We'll talk also about classic Green Bay Cap Packers games as well, and maybe some classic. Uh, <laughs> I mean, because what was happened, Joey? At last time we chatted, we went off the air, and we spent maybe thirty to forty minutes just chatting about like the eighties and nineties football, um, baseball. I don't know what else. So like, who's was his just, favorite? Like, does he think? Okay, so I, I, you should ask him tomorrow. I always. Two days. Uh, yeah, I, th I thought it was tomorrow. Was, oh, yeah, I guess today's Monday. Um, oh, I ask him if he thinks, uh, I don't know if he cares about like the sort of more recent Packers teams, but I always thought that the Packers wasted Javon Walker behind Donald Driver instead of just cutting ties with Driver as he got into his late 20s, early 30s. And Javon Walker was the better receiver all along. You should ask him about that, see what he says. I'll see what he says. Yeah, yeah. those are big Driver in the franchise. You get rid of Driver if you take the Packers and just let Javon Walker run with it. That's a name I haven't heard of, uh, Donald Driver, for quite a while. So, yeah we'll, yeah, we'll go into that. Also, Joey, I think it's a good time to talk sponsors. Let's do it. This is the time. So Okay, so we'll do Easy DNS, and then we obviously have some news to not share, but amplify um, from the bull camp. So Mark Jeftovic, Easy DNS, he's the proprietor, friendly neighborhood, hosting, service, domain name, registrar, all the stuff you need. Me and Len use them. Posting on the website more and more. I, I know some of you guys reached out and said you – I've been enjoying the research reports. I know you guys read Lens Week to Come on CBP every Sunday. It's a good place for you to catch up with us and see what's coming on Monday night so you can get ready to talk smack in the chat with uh, all your friends and some enemies. Also over at, uh, at uh, Easy DNS, if you want to do anything with a virtual private server, so you set up your website and you maybe want to do more, you want to do BTC Pay Server, you want to do a Bitcoin node, you want to build your own Nostra Relay, which we have, actually. I think we have CanadianBitcoiners.com on Nostra, I'm pretty sure. Um, no, I think we, we do. do. I, I'm pretty sure I'm verified on Nostra with CanadianBitcoiners.com. I wouldn't well, know because I haven't... Relay. Oh, that's, I don't know what it is. What is that? Getting, yeah. That's simply, uh, what, the NIP05? It's, like, it's been a while since I looked into that. That's just getting your name verified. Nostra Relay, like you'd have to connect a bunch of relays, and they're the ones that are sending and receiving the messages for you there's not one central entity you have to selectively choose which ones you want to connect to hmm. and i do have this thing thing i have i definitely have the check mark so i don't know how i got that but what, what is that we just don't know what that's called verification i think kind. it's a nipple five I think mark that's what whatever it is mark did it he did it for us he took care of it and uh you know if you want to do any of that stuff or know this implementation now that that service is uh deceased at least in part Mark will help you. Head over to use DNS. Take care of whatever you need to take care of. Uh, do the same stuff we're doing. Do your own thing. Whatever the it is you want to do, Mark and his team will help you do it. CBP Media is the code. Or catch him in the chat Monday night. Or just tweet at him. Or, uh, I don't know, Carrier Pigeon, Smoke Signal. The Vatican still uses that. A lot of people care about that Smoke Signal, so maybe Mark will care about yours. Anyway, great sponsor. We're happy to be working with him. But he's not the one we're talking about tonight, is it? Uh, maybe we should talk about the other sponsor. What's going on uh, with that sponsor? Well, very briefly, let's talk about what they offer, which is quite a bit, especially right now. And you can buy and sell your Bitcoin. Look, the price of Bitcoin has been hovering around. This, this is bull, bull Bitcoin, by the way. Len, skip the name. Bull Bitcoin yeah, is bull the Bitcoin, sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm looking at the price. $69,000. How long have we been stuck in this high 60s, low 70s? It's been 
month, three weeks, probably. two weeks. Yeah, almost. That's a long time to just be stuck here. So it's stable coin territory, maybe. But bull Bitcoin, you could buy, you could sell your Bitcoin. There's lots you could do over there. On-chain lightning. So if the fees are going up, last time I checked, they weren't all that high. So you may want to do your on-chain buys moving forward until things change. But who knows? Ruins may change everything, and you might have to start buying on lightning. <laughs> Anyways, so with both Bitcoin, other different options you could do, you could pay your bills with your Bitcoin. So if you have a Bitcoin stack that you want to start using and start spending it out in the real world, you can with a couple of different ways. Number one, as I mentioned, you could pay your bills. So if you have like your electrical bill, your gas bill, whatever the heck you got to pay through bull Bitcoin, you could start spending your Bitcoin and start paying those bills. The second thing you could do with your Bitcoin and spend it is buying gift cards through bull Bitcoin. So you can use those gift cards in the real world and indirectly use your Bitcoin to pay for your purchases, your goods and services, and live on the Bitcoin standard just the way Satoshi wanted you to. But the best thing they have, and April 15th, it looks like it may be coming to an end, is the KYC free buys where you can go to Canada Post, load up your bull Bitcoin account with Canadian dollars, and there's no identification right now, and just no KYC, so you're good to go. And uh, the spread is really cheap, the cheapest in Canada. It could be cheapest in the world. I can't say I don't travel that much, but still, either way, it's cheap. It's easy to do. But keep in mind, April 15th, they are going to start asking you for identification at the post office. And that means that there's going to be a little bit of information they're going to ask for you. And that's all I know at this particular moment. I can't mm -hmm. share anything more because I don't have anything more to share, except for April 15th is a deadline where they're going to start asking for identification at the post office. Could be more to come on that front from Bull. I'll just say this, okay? Me and you make a big deal about the KYC free, and I, I'll be honest, I use it a lot. I, I'm sure you do too. I don't use it exclusively. Like I still do easy e-transfer buys or whatever if I'm like in the mood for a quick dopamine hit in the stack. I think a lot of people still do that. I'll just say this, okay? I can see in the chat there's discussion around, well, we got to find an alternative. I'm not going to say that there's not a place for KYC free Bitcoin. There is, of course there is. We've been talking about it for months. You know, we've been with bull almost a year now, it feels like. And uh, in, in the near year we've been with them, we've gotten to know the team a little bit. There may be alternatives for KYC free Bitcoin, but I will tell you right now, there is no alternative for the kind of people working at a company like bull anywhere else in the space. Okay? I'm not going to name other companies. I'm not going to name other people. But I will tell you, and it's not like I'm breaking news here. The Bull team is as mission-focused and as anti-fiat as any group of men I've ever met in my life. And if that's the kind of thing you want to support, you know how to support it. If you want to go somewhere else, you go somewhere else. But um, for me, and I think for a lot of other people, that really matters. Um and I, you know, I plan on continuing to use them uh, for the, you know, the the vast majority of my buys. Again, there's other options, but for me, I don't know. Like I, I have a hard time now saying to myself, "What are we going to do? We're going to not support guys who I know are extremely mission focused, not worried about anything else, not worried about, you know, outside pressure." And uh, you know, it's it's so long, maybe. And uh, not goodbye. What is that saying? Wait, see you later. Don't say goodbye. Say so long or whatever. I can't remember. Something but, like uh, you know, who knows? These guys are innovators, man. I wouldn't be surprised if there was another avenue for KYC free um, in the works. Yeah. And like people are saying in the chat, you could use RoboSats for non-KYC yeah. Bitcoin. If you really have to buy KYC free, um, BISC, BISC2, HODL, HODL. Mm-hmm. Probably a few others too. That there's, a, there's options. There's options. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. All right. So that's out of the way. If anybody has any questions, feel free to throw it at us and hopefully we'll be able to answer it. But I also have some boosts I got to get out of the way. Let's too. do it. And then I do, I want to talk a bit about the next few weeks on the show because we have a bunch of double interview weeks coming up. Let's just prime people for that too. Doom Dumasm, 521 sats. Thank you name. for your time. He always did the same thing, 521 sets, and he's, thank you for your time. So it's becoming a regular. I You're love welcome. the fact he's doing You're that. You're welcome. He, he was on the verge of getting cut because he was fifth lowest in terms of sets because Wedge Social sent in a 1,000 sets. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Wedge? Dan Wedge? From yeah. Chips Down with Grant? I haven't heard Dan Wedge in a year, probably. I haven't heard from him. He's a Noster. He, he, wow. he engages with me quite a bit on Wow, Wedge, what's up, man? That's a throwback. Awesome to hear from him. Okay, go ahead. And he's listening to us all the time. 
because he when he engages me on Nostra, he's listening to the show and quoting what we've done. So love it. He's a loyal listener. Thousand Sats, he writes in Larga Vida, E S S D R. Larga Vida means like uh, long life. Gotta but mean something ESSDR, life, right? D R. I don't know what that stands for. El Salvador, but E S S D R. I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to that. Maybe somebody can answer, mm. or maybe Wedge could let me know in the future. But either way, thanks for the Sats. The Bird, one thousand Sats. He writes in Madex equals principles over preference. Strong Legend. work. Legend. Doug and Roop, 1,000 sats. So he writes in Madex, phrased it so well when he said, when it comes to yourself, selling out is something that you'll never buy back. Combine that with the Joker. Sometimes it's not about the money. It's about sending a message. It says, rest at ankle, Madex, and look forward to adding some more stickers to my Fiat mining desk. Great rip, JNL. Love it. Thank you. Love it. And the last we have Jordab, 24,000 sats. Thank Dad. you very much for that. He says, happy birthday, CBP, for real this time. Crazy to think that you guys have been putting out quality content for the past 156 weeks. Joey, thanks for talking about it all those years ago. This truly changed my life. Also, thanks to PLP, Plate Licking Pleb, for the rest of the sats. <laughs> so and I just want to mention that all the stats we received to date on, I mean, for the past while on yeah. our fountain, it's going to go to Madex and also our referral code, our referral uh, missionary stuff from Bull Bitcoin for the next week and for the past few weeks we've collected is going to go to Madex as well. So please keep buying, buying, buying. Using yeah, our man, code. use your, like, um, you know, really we're giving away what's probably going to wind up being a fairly lucrative week of referral fees. So pump, pump it up, man. It's all going to a good cause. Hope that guy's ankle heal up or whatever. Len, at the conference in uh, May, I'm doing a panel with Madex and Francis that I think is going to be really, really good uh, on the main stage. I can't remember what time. I think it's this, the Friday at noon or 12.10. I forget what time, but um, really looking forward to, to talking with those guys. About That's the first day. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. First day. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Um, okay. So next week, if I'm looking at this calendar right, we are absolutely slammed. So tomorrow, uh, nothing. No, Wednesday. Wednesday, Bob Burnett. Right, April third, the ninth, nuclear Bitcoin, Orion the Cloud. I'll do that one. Uh, the tenth, it looks like Floyd Floyd Marinescu wants to do April tenth. I thought he was in May. We could move him to May. No, no, I'll do it. I'll do two. I don't care. It's fine with me. I owe you. Uh, it's no big deal. So Ryan McLeod, nuclear Bitcoiner. We'll talk about all things nuclear uh, going on in the world. He's always sending me messages about stuff that we talk about on the show. So I'm looking forward to talking with him in a longer format. Uh, he's always been a, a fan favorite. And then Floyd Mar Marinescu is a guy who is a UBI and land value tax proponent in Canada. And uh, I think and you're laughing. I think there's going to be more that you agree with him on than not, honestly. The, 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 maybe the, the solution, there may be some granular disagreement, but I think broadly you will agree that we've done a lot of things wrong along the way in terms of the incentive structure. Uh, so I'll be talking to him. And then the week after that, Plate Liquor, I think is coming to my house. So I have to find out what his plans are. Uh, Len, if I can figure it out, we're going to do that episode from the weight room. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move all the cameras and stuff into the weight room and get the two wireless mics going and we'll rip while uh, I spot him as he benches 95 pounds on the barbell. I think that's probably all he can do. So uh, we'll do that. <laughs> no, he's... <laughs> that man, he's way higher than that. Uh, tar, who is Taris Kulik, Kulik on the he's, 17th? He's a... Uh, Bitcoin mining. He's related with Bitcoin. My Sunnyside Inc. So okay. this is a referral from Boomer. Oh. So he's been moving around a little bit. He's rescheduled a few times. So hopefully he'll stick for this one. We'll yeah. See. Okay. That sounds good. And then the week after that, the Carrazos will be at my house Tuesday at 11 a.m. the 23rd. So I'll be streaming that one live early in the day. So watch that one. Looking at you, listener viewer. Crystal Woody and Jeff Lucas, the 24th. And then Len, on the 30th, I will be talking to David Bailey and Mark Goodwin about uh, all things Bitcoin Magazine, the conference, et cetera, et cetera. So packed. How many interviews we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight interview episodes plus five flagships. So, in and April. in response to that, uh, the 29th of yeah. April, the day before for that, because I don't want to be anywhere near those motherfuckers. I have somebody replacing me. Who? 
somebody coming in and he goes wow. by Dan, <laughs> aka Bitcoin Scribe. You know him. Everybody oh, knows him. Scribe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. He's coming sure. in. We've made sure. arrangements that he could take over for me that day. So the 29th, he's coming in. And that okay. week, I am not touching anything to do <laughs> with that because <laughs> those guys, they are. They're radioactive. I'll try, I'll try I, I, and ask I don't some, want to wear my radioactive I'll, suit that day. I'll try and ask some good questions. Anyway, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a busy month, and then probably um, as we usually do in the summer. <clears throat> although I do see still a bunch of interviews already scheduled. <laughs> the summer maybe maybe we won't slow down like we usually do, but we might we might we might do a few more nooners and stuff like that. Try and keep the Wednesdays Wednesdays episodes uh, a bit shorter for your sanity and for ours uh, here at CBP. So. Len, where do you want to start? We got lots of uh, heat to discuss tonight. Uh, I'll leave it up to you. Where, where should Let's we start with play first? Something a little bit non-controversial, like give us a, an opportunity to smile on things because there's going to be more filtering options moving forward for node runners out there because Umbrel, this is the OS that is popular amongst node runners. They have announced they're going to be offering Bitcoin knots as an option for people. And from what I understand, Bitcoin Core is or was the default node software available on Umbrel. I don't know if they have offered anything else aside from that, but they also they are now offering knots. So with knots, they're giving the users the ability to filter out trash that they don't want on their mempools, namely the JPEGs. And if you read through the comments on X, because I never ran Umbrel. It looks like it's not possible to edit the Bitcoin.conf in the UI through Umbrel, right? And the file that you should that you are able to edit the Umbrel dash Bitcoin.conf didn't seem too effective with respect to filtering out stuff out of your mempool. So now with this option, with knots, you're going to have the option of, in the UI to just go ahead and do it, and you're good to go. And further comments show that it's it's now like it's live and people are doing it and it's working fine. Um, I'm not sure exactly if you have to edit, like I mentioned, a, U, a UI or a config file, but either way, the option exists somehow that you could filter this out. And I know a number of people out there run Umbro, right? It's an mm. easy rendition to run it. And um, it, this might encourage them to also run knots. And the way I understand it is if you are running right now Umbrel and you want to move over to knots, I believe you have to start from scratch and resync everything. I don't think you just download knots and move over from there. From what I see, people are resyncing. They're doing initial block download and starting from scratch. But either way, um, so on top of this, we have like uh, Umbrel that I just mentioned. And there's another OS out there called Bitcoin, another uh, OS that allows for people to run a Bitcoin node called Citadel. I never heard of Citadel before, but they also announced they're going to allow for Bitcoin knots as an option starting in Citadel version 0.3.5 so there you go the citadel just an fyi this is also not just a bitcoin node that you could run on that os but also a lightning node that you could run on that and it could be done on raspberry pi fives so the movement for more filters continues but i would suggest for people out there umbrel it isn't really in my opinion the best option if you recall not too long ago the clearnet fiasco where they were pinging the server through clearnet yeah. even though you you were running on tor still they were calling the mothership through clearnet to find out if there were any updates and through that you never know if, if they were harvesting ips they said they weren't but still the question remains so there's some questions with everything that's going on with umbrella i would suggest look at other options if you just want to run a node you could do that on your windows your Mac OS or even Linux, which is my perf my preference, and you can run Core, you can run uh, Knots strictly on those, and do it simply and do it easily without dealing with these other OSs. But still, for people out there that want to run them, the umbrellas of the world, the option exists. Knots is available, and you can now start filtering. This is good news. Should mention that you did a somewhat deep dive into nodes on the Karadza show on your life, your terms came out last week. So if you're looking for a little more on nodes, you can definitely get it there. So I guess, Len, like you're mentioning there that there's like a sync, I shouldn't say an issue, but you do have to resync your your blockchain there. You're, you have to download all the Bitcoin transactions. I mean, that's not a, that's not that big a deal, is it? It's not like you have to sit there and watch it. You hook it up, you start it and come back in a week or whatever and it's done, right? So I, it's like a, a process that you have to go through when you set up a node. I mean, I'm saying this like I know I don't actually have a node as many people have pointed out to me. So <laughs> let's get you going. I know. I know. Um, do you expect this to continue? That all these people are going to release uh, op like new options and provide a feature set that lets you, you know, 
get rid of uh, spam, I guess, is what you would say. Uh, well, probably, right? It, it seems I like think going so. To. Yeah. People like it. People are, are asking for it. And the developers of the these operating systems are now enabling the users to take advantage of it. So why wouldn't they? So give people an option. If they want to take advantage of it, go ahead. It's not like Knox is very old or outdated. It no. it's continually gets updated just alongside core. So there's it just gives you more functionality, easier ways to filter. You can still filter with core. Don't yeah. let's not dance around this. Core, you could do, do the exact same thing. Just go into Bitcoin.com file. Actually, I, I did a video on that not too long ago, and I cited the re, uh, the resource that pointed me to all that, which is Bitcoin all caps. And he outlined what three or yeah three different lines I believe it is you have to put in, or two or three different lines you put in your Bitcoin.com, and that's enough to to filter out your trash. But yeah, to go answer your question that was long-winded. I think more of these software developers are going to be offering it because people want it. Options are good and people like to filter out this trash. Let's keep doing it. This is the way to go. I do think that the people, like regardless of my feelings or your feelings or anyone's feelings on ordinals and inscriptions, it does seem to me like there's like the the population of people who run nodes are this like there's a lot of overlap with the I don't want any junk on the blockchain crowd. Right. It's really the people who don't run nodes that don't really care. But the people who are deep enough that they have a node running, I think, want that optionality. I would expect that. I mean, I don't know if you can even measure this. You might be able to. You might not. I'm not sure. Maybe you can tell me. But I would expect that the number of nodes that have some kind of filter running is going to be more than 65 percent. That's like by the time this is all said and done. Right. It's, I think it's got to be right. It seems to me like that's the right group of people to ask if they want the optionality and most of them would just turn it on because they are kind of what's the, what's the, you know, phrase they're, they're more committed, right? They care more about what's going on on the network, let's say, than maybe someone who doesn't have a node. So I would expect that population is going to run pretty hot when it comes to uh, whether they turn that on or not. Right. Do I have that right. I think I do. I actually, I'm in the opposite end of the spectrum. I, I'm, if I had to hazard a guess, I would say a very low number of people are actually engaging with the filtering of their nodes. A lot of people, I would imagine, are running stuff like Umbrel, and up until now, you didn't have the option to do that, so they were mm -hmm. just doing that. So I think now, with the option available, oh, when, to yeah, when Umbrel the dust leaders, when the dust settles, like sixty five percent, is that the right number, or is it too high? Probably a rather high, but it's it's going to be creeping up every every month, just because of through education and the options available. I think that number is going to be creeping up. We'll probably be in the twenties, maybe thirties, if mm. and that's even very high at that. That's but okay. Yeah, I could be wrong, I, and I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'd be surprised, honestly. But I, it's look, the the whole point of Bitcoin is everyone gets to do, you know, the and the ordinals crowd would make this case too. I'm, I'm using everything I'm doing is in the rules of the network. Well, so is filtering out the transactions. So we're we're all going to play by the same set of rules and may the best man win, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's move on, Joey. You want to talk about Coinbase? I think it's a good opportunity to talk we about may that. as well yeah sure let's dunk on me some more here i got the ordinals no, going up first filtering it no out fucking, now we got the coinbase go ahead there's no fucking talking about it. <laughs> this is, because they're going through their own set of headaches with u.s regulators out there yeah. because coinbase yeah. the question is are they operating as an unregistered broker exchange it, this is, okay i agree house yeah give the summary and then i got a lot to say about this honestly i think it's ridiculous but go ahead well so this is it's all part of the SEC that they laid charges against Coinbase and Binance not too long ago. Now, the Binance, I believe that is more, let's not even talk about this, but Coinbase has tried unsuccessfully to get this lawsuit dismissed. And the judge who oversaw the dismissal request said that the regulatory agency, the SEC, had a plausible cause against the exchange. So the judge is of the opinion that, yeah, maybe there is something here that needs to be heard. And as I mentioned, it's all part of a lawsuit, which the SEC claims that Coinbase is violating federal security laws. And they they might have made trading and staking available to just about anybody out there with a pulse and identification. And that is part of the sticking point that the SEC has. So the trading and staking purposes is just about anybody. And the judge believes that Coinbase didn't seem to be acting as a brokerage. So with respect to that, that part of the lawsuit has been dismissed. So the other parts, though, the um, exchange and clearinghouse uh, that may still, well, that looks like it's going to be heard. And if it is indeed true that they are, 
then they're going to be wrapped pretty damn hard. But we'll see what happens with the court, the, the court case because I'm wondering how successful the SEC will be with this one, with this they, they case here. Be. Because given be. their track record, the recent track record, and you know, look at what happened with Ripple, for example. I don't know. Maybe they're they may not have anything to stand on here. But since Coinbase is the holder of choice for a lot of ETFs, so the ETFs are utilizing Coinbase as the custodian for Bitcoin. It makes me wonder what's going to happen moving forward with Bitcoin, because there is a strong connection right now, at least between for people that like to talk about price between the price of Bitcoin and what's going on with Coinbase. If something were to come out that is going to be really bad damage against Coinbase, I think that's going to impact the price of Bitcoin negatively for a short period of time and it'll catch up. But still, we, we can't overlook that there is a connection right now, at least between the ETFs and Coinbase. And yeah, this lawsuit is still going on and let remains to be seen what's going to happen. But I want to hear your thoughts. It looks like you have some some opinions here you want to share. Well, because again, like I'm not I'm not saying anything new here. I've said it on this show and on other appearances I've done, including your life your terms, including, you know, Mike Campbell's money talks. When Coinbase filed their S1, okay? 4 years ago at this point. Or four, 3 years ago at this point, whatever year it was, they they went public 20 or 21, I forget now, but 21 20. March. Okay, so there you go. They they to get the S1 approved. So the SEC lets an unregistered securities dealer, their words, not mine, go public. Okay. That's number one. Then the SEC's unregistered securities dealer is the avenue through which the US government buys, or sorry, I shouldn't say buys, although they could be, I guess, but sells Bitcoin that they've confiscated over the years. They could go anywhere to sell the Bitcoin. Kraken, for example, which is not an unregistered securities dealer, though has similarly been in the crosshairs. Uh, in the last few years, they go to Coinbase to sell it. So this illegal, this, this entity that's operating illegally that you just approved to go public, you're also using it to sell your bags uh, to the public. Okay, so you got two there. Then you approve after so much you know, debate and uh, disrepute these ETF products, including, by the way, changing the grayscale Bitcoin trust, which has existed for a long time, to eat to an ETF. Never had a problem with Grayscale, by the way, right? Grayscale has been operating in this, this fucking gray zone when it comes to the bankruptcy. Story for another time. Uh, you, you approve all these ETF products where Coinbase is the custodian. Your illegal securities dealer is the custodian for public-facing ETF products for which there is demand unprecedented anywhere in the modern market economy, Okay. Now you're telling me that you're going to continue to go down this road saying that they're running some kind of illegal operation. What, what leg do they have to stand on? Gensler at this point is just like sub submitting himself to these public humiliation rituals on a regular basis. He's losing everywhere. As much as I don't you know, want to talk about Ethereum, I, I'm even looking at the way he talks about the, the Ethereum ETF. Is this, guy, is this guy like for real? There's going to be an ETF for Ethereum. Whether I want it, or whether I don't want it, whether he wants it or doesn't want it, there's going to be an ETF for Ethereum because the guys who are walking the dog and giving the dog biscuits, guys like Fink and others, want the product. He he's he's going down this road where he just doesn't seem to care about how legitimate he looks. He only wants to you know sort of feign this power over markets and over uh, entities that are operating in the U.S. market. Is Coinbase running a securities exchange? I, I don't know. I don't even think it matters, honestly, Len. Like to me, it, it doesn't matter at all. You've given implicit approval to this company over the last three years, vis-a-vis -vis all these other actions that you've taken and the actions that you haven't taken during the same period. And now this is when you're gonna try and run. Like I, I just I don't get it. I, I really don't. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens because it seems to me like Coinbase is just so much better equipped to handle this stuff. On another note, uh in the past, you've seen Bitcoin companies, Coinbase included, take on former SEC and other regulator uh, legal support, attorneys, whatnot, people who would you would who you would imagine know the inner workings of some of these institutions and agencies. There's been a recent push. I don't remember where I saw this, but there was a, a semi-prominent person on Twitter. I say semi-prominent. Sure, shit, more prominent than me and you. <laughs> but he's talking on Twitter about how these companies now are basically saying behind closed doors, do not hire anyone from the SEC anymore. Let these guys rot in obscurity once their regime turns over. 
no more revolving door into crypto. We don't want them. We don't need them. They're complicit. They're architecting the problem. They're not just being fooled by Gensler. And so I think there's been a, a real shift in the power dynamic between the SEC and the crypto companies. Mostly, I will I will admit that this mostly comes as a result of traditional finance entities grabbing the bull by the horns here in a major way when it comes to DTF products. Um, and I expect Coinbase to win because it's in everyone's interest now as far as where the money is that Coinbase continues to win and dunk on the SEC. And Gensler just looks... He just looks like a sad little man at this point, honestly. You know, he gets on TV and Joe Kernan fucking, you know, 360 windmills on him. He gets on Twitter and people fucking dunk on him. His agency can't keep the fucking Twitter password secure. Like, what is he doing to protect anybody? The answer is nothing. He, the agency has lost all its teeth. It's lost its legitimacy, like so much of the U.S. government at this point. And uh, I expect it to continue. It's only going one way and it's just, it's not going to get better for this guy, I don't think, before November. Well, look at the way the winds are blowing because it's going to be – because we'll go to the next story. It's going to give an idea because this one either flew under the radar or nobody gives a shit about it. You hear what's going on with KuCoin? <laughs> no. No, KuCoin, I haven't. Len, I haven't heard about what's going on with KuCoin. Tell me. <laughs> well, KuCoin and two of its founders, they've been charged with Bank Secrecy Act and money laundering violations. Cool. This is, I suspect this is rather large because this was spearheaded by – Damien Will Williams, this is District of New York. So that's the person that's involved there. So KuCoin and its two founders, Chun Gan and Kei Tang, hope I pronounced it right. They're mm -hmm. accused of operating without proper anti-money laundering protocols. And the U.S. is arguing that KuCoin has pulled the wool over the eyes of the U.S. by fudging the numbers of reported U.S. users that are trading on their platform. The U.S., also is arguing that KuCoin has a responsibility to act accordingly to help identify and drive out crime and corrupt financing schemes, aka money laundering. Sure. And KuCoin not reporting certain data, well, this has put them in hot water. And what I find odd is that this is one of the world's largest exchanges, but this news isn't even making a ripple. And I'm not talking about that shitcoin XRP. <laughs> this nobody's really talking about this, which is kind of odd, at least from what I gather. Yeah. And so they only introduced a KYC program, KuCoin did, back as late as July 2023. So up until last year, in the middle of last year, they didn't have a KYC program. <laughs> and this only applies to new customers. So if you're an nice. old customer, you still can fly under the radar. So it seems rather late in the game to be offering this, but the U.S. investigators revealed that KuCoin's operations purportedly they allowed over $5 billion of suspicious and criminal funds to flow through their exchange. And this was all before KYC became a requirement, at least for the new customers. And some of these funds are being tied into Tornado Cash. Remember them? So, you know, there's some things here that just seems very fishy, at least with respect to at least the way that the U.S. is looking at things. Mm -hmm. And these charges were laid by the Department of Justice. These are similar to the ones that were done against Binance. And it looks like they're slowly going through all the files that they have on their desk to get to each exchange and make sure that they're doing everything what the U.S. thinks they should be doing. So this is an interesting story, but not many people are talking about this for whatever reason, but here we are. KuCoin is under the eyes of the radar for the U.S. government. Interesting. Narwhal's in the chat saying that KuCoin was uh, one of the last sort of OFAC-resistant uh, exchanges out there. So maybe that's related, right? You got Tornado Cash, you got OFAC resistance, the KYC program that wasn't until last year and now uh yeah under the gun i don't know like it's it's maybe it's just because we're in north america i don't think kucoin is very popular over here there's a lot of other options that are a little easier and a little more transparent so probably it's not top of mind for many of us but something to keep an eye on there's, there is no bad data point when it comes to these stories it's good to keep good to see like where everyone is coming down on these things and uh this is just another example of why you should be careful of where you spend your money in terms of buying bitcoin because now you know presumably some of the names and addresses associated with that exchange are going to be under the microscope a little bit more than maybe they want it to be the one thing that i'm just again i just reiterate i'm shocked that not many people are talking about it it just seems that yeah. you know when finance was fucked over by the there's so much uh, other stuff going on though then like we'll you know what i mean there's just i guess maybe i don't know Maybe, or maybe we're just numb to this at this particular moment. Yeah. We've gone through this enough times. I, I actually yeah, didn't see this story once on Twitter, like not even a single time. Where did you see it? I don't. I, I Twitter. Should ask. 
yeah, Twitter. Then I, then I dug deep and I found the CoinDesk article. I found others and help me, you know, formulate my opinion here. But anyways, very odd. Either way, another one that's odd. Nilan. I hope I pronounced it right. Nilan Resources. You ever heard Nilan? Sorry, Nilan. Yeah, the gold, the gold miners, right? Yeah. The gold and copper guys. And yeah. Apparently, they're based out of Quebec, so they're Canadian at that. Now, this is a classic pump and dump. This is going to be good, Joy. <laughs> it's, it's, there's some interesting stuff I learned along the way. So rumors are floating around not too long ago, just last week, that the, this gold mining company, Nilam Resources, was going to buy 24,800 Bitcoin. And this was reported by some websites like Global Newswire, Seeking Alpha, and a few mm -hmm. others. And the news, you know, this was entered, it's going to be a letter of intent with something called cyber data. And they were going to acquire a special purpose entity to establish under the name of MindWave. They're going to be, MindWave was going to hold the 24,800 Bitcoin. And through this, Nilam was going to acquire 100% capital stock of MindWave, and they're going to be selling some new, newly authorized uh, Series C stock in exchange for that. This is just a lot of, you know, shifting of uh, the chairs on the Titanic. But really, in the end, so Nilam Resources, was, Nilam Resources was going to buy a bunch of Bitcoin. And the problem is they didn't have the capital to execute this type of buy. The market cap of Nilam before this all took place was around five ish million US dollars. And the Bitcoin value at the time they announced it was around $1.7 billion. So you do the math, $5 million company trying to buy $1.7 billion worth of Bitcoin. If they could do that, the CVP, we should be doing the same thing. We'll That's what to Bitcoin. say. <laughs> so, so numbers obviously don't add up, but still, even if they don't add up, so people out there, they jumped on board because it, raised a whole bunch of uh, speculators, you know, this is going to go up. And the stock price did jump up. It started from around 1.6 cents a share to as high as 30 cents a share in just one day. And this jump even happened after the news was debunked. And furthermore, the CEO, Ron McIntyre, resigned as he was reported as saying, just look at this chart. It's a classic <laughs> pump and dump. This is right from their former CFO. Now, he says his coworkers have indicated there was going to be a transaction forthcoming, but they never gave him the details of the deal and issued a press release without letting him review it or telling him about the announcement. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, a bunch of guys, in the, at least according to him, this is all alleged, a bunch of guys within the team, they went around the CEO, released this information, increased the stock price, and I guess they made bank as a result of this. Somebody, somebody's going to jail here, Len. Someone's going to somebody jail. Somebody has to. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is a classic you know, pump and dump. This is the Trad 5 version of inscriptions. It's purely trash, <laughs> shady moves, and here we are. Remember Briex? It's not quite on those side of things, on that level, but man, oh man, it's always a Canadian gold mining company that seems to be involved. But on the flip side, once another company does announce they're going to buy Bitcoin, and as long as it's within their means to buy it, obviously you see investors are, are happy with that. So maybe this might encourage another company out there to actually do the purchase, but these guys are not. I don't know if you saw that. And there's another announcement that uh, shipping containers full of gold foil found at uh, Neyland Mines' most recent uh, gold discovery too. Gold foil, gold confetti, gold spray paint. Yeah, you got to look into that. That's an interesting. You remember uh, Briex? No, I'm too young for that. That's like the late or late 80s, early 90s, right? I'm pretty sure. Late 90s. That's, they were the company who said they found a mine in Africa and nobody ever went to check it out. Is that them? And then finally when like somebody went. Indonesia or somewhere oh, okay. in that vicinity. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And it, it turned out that it was nothing they, they salted the, they salted the, <laughs> the testing, the, the, the soil that they did. Oh, man. Somebody ended up getting pushed outside of a helicopter, I think. No, he just fell. He's fell. Yeah, well, they found his remains like weeks later, ravaged by animals. But yeah, it was a sad situation. Either this way, reminds me. This, this you know, what this reminds me of. Remember, like in twenty seventeen or eighteen, it was during the ICO craze. I'm pretty sure. I can't remember now, but remember Long Island Ice Tea or whatever changed their name to Long Island Blockchain or something like that. No, it, no. It, it just feels like this is the same kind of move. Like I, I got to get, I got to get my stock, my options up and I got to exercise. Them. So I got to, I got to do something. What am I going to do? I got to tell everyone that I'm going to buy a billion in Bitcoin or whatever the number was. I think that's, that's it's like the same thing. It's like the same thing. You should look that up. People are listening. Long Island blockchain. If you're, if you came in in 2020, you don't remember that, but uh, 
it's a story worth telling. If you think that anything you see today is crazy, 2017 was fucking nuts. Some of the stuff that was going on. It's what I used to do. They changed the blockchain. Kodak, I think, changed to a blockchain company too for like a hot minute. Did they not? Like it was a total psycho mess. What did Kodak Kodak or, or Polaroid? Was it Polaroid or Kodak? One of them was Kodak like oh, shifted away know? from from I, I can't remember now. I can't remember. But one of those companies like yeah, moved to blockchain. Kodak. Yeah, yeah. I just oh it's, my this God. this kind of is like the same strategy. It feels like <laughs> I think anyway. I don't know. Maybe you have a different opinion, but pretty wild that that went on then. And now you have you know gold mining companies saying no, don't abandon us. We'll buy Bitcoin. <laughs> Holy this is the only way they're gonna make me relevant moving forward. That's crazy, man. Just crazy. Uh, Got a few more stories. Three more, in fact. This would be perfect. It will get us up at close to the hour. Sure. SBF. Hey, okay. 25 years. What do you think? Well, let's just do the rundown first. So he was sentenced to 25 years in prison for his involvement with Alameda Research and FTX. And from what I'm reading, it's not gonna be the maximum security facility. I'm not sure what level it is, but they're saying it's not going to be at a maximum a maximum security. Also, CoinDesk is writing that he will be placed as close as possible to his family. So they're going to try to accommodate his family and him as much as possible to have him at least located in a close proximity to his family. Cool. The Department of Probation was recommending a 105-year sentence. And well, that is actually much less than what prosecutors were pushing at around the 40 to 50-year range. So he's given 25 years in the end. And remember, he was living a good life for a while. And this was on the dime of customers, you know, parties, League of Legends, orgies, and God knows whatever else. And perhaps all three at the same time. I don't really know. <laughs> but this closes the door on this chapter, at least for now. Because we talked about it, you and I, briefly on Axis of Easy last week. For people that have not subscribed, I suggest you do so. And I know you're of the opinion that he's not going to be ser serving the full 25 years. No Am way. I correct on that? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's no way. There's no way. Yeah. So, in fact, didn't we make a comparison? Who's going to be coming out first, him or Ross? It, was it you that asked? No, that we're question? saying if you if you had to pick between Ross, Assange, and SBF, oh, yeah. when the dust settles, who's going to have served the longest sentence? It's no one's taking SBF in that. No one. I'm going with Ross for the longest sentence. I don't know why. I think that he they're going to just see that through. It could be wrong. But yeah, anything else you want to add to this story? Because it was a big thing a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, I don't know. Not really. It's, you know, not it's not enough. He bankrupted a ton of people. The guys from All In uh, did a segment on this this week or last week. I forget. And they honestly, those four guys don't know fuck all about this SBF operation, FTX, nothing. They're like, oh, it was a profitable business. I don't know why he did the stuff he did. Like, well, guys, let me tell you, it wasn't a profitable business. The only time that he was able to like, you know, make money was when he stole it from people. So um, just be careful who you listen to, I guess. Just listen to me and Len instead. We know what we're talking about. But anyway, the 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 sentence. I mean, I can't imagine the guy serves more than I don't know, 10, 15 years. Like, what, what, why, why do you think he's going to serve more than that? He's a huge Democratic no. donor, huge, huge Republican donor. Like, he's, you know, he's greased to the palms. People, that you know, it's, it's like, it's like that woke bespoke thing. Like, you know, woke or sorry, broke is he's going to serve the whole sentence. Woke is he's only going to serve ten or fifteen years, and uh, bespoke is. He wasn't greasing palms to stay out of jail. He was greasing palms to get out of jail early because he knew he was going uh, when he was given all those donations. That's my guess. And so I would say, I don't know. Boomer, it looks like Boomer and, and Julian and Kinetic Finance have a bet at 15 years. Would you take the over or under on 15 years? Way, way under. I, mm. I, I'm wearing a tinfoil hat for this one. Okay. And I suspect his involvement with who he's dealt with, probably information he knows, maybe something's going to happen. Oh, you think he's going to die? I, I never said that. But <laughs> you're reading between the lines. Perhaps. Wow. Uh, okay. But, like, that's, you know. Sam Bankman Epstein. Okay, sure. Who's going right? to serve a longer, who's going to serve a longer jail sentence? Bankman, Sam Bankman Freed or P. Diddy? Is P. Diddy in jail? Oh, no. You don't know. Okay. No. Well, we, we're not going to talk about it on there. Okay. People in the chat. Who's, who you got? Longer sentence. P. Diddy or, uh. Or Sam Bankman Freed. Anyway, next story. I don't Go even ahead. know what he did. Yeah, well, look it up. <laughs> or should I look it up? Not... Uh, don't look it up now. And definitely, if you're going to Google it, maybe do it incognito. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, yeah, users on X, they're reporting that Google has 
integrated blockchain explorer into their search engine. And all you need to do is type in the search field Bitcoin followed by the Bitcoin address, and it should show you the balance for that particular address. But when I tried it out using a generic address that I've been looking at, uh, I tried to find on Google, uh, it didn't work for me. And maybe because I wasn't logged into Google or maybe, I, I don't know, but for whatever reason, it didn't work for me, but others are reporting that you're able to do this. But either way, if this does work for you, I would strongly suggest not plugging in any addresses that are associated with your Bitcoin transactions. Yep. Um, doing so, you know, you're going to be tying your identification, your IP and potentially your Google account to a search, which you're doing, which is presumably your Bitcoin address. That's why when I did a search, I just used some generic address I found. I just typed in generic address Bitcoin and I got that and tried searching that. So it's, this is also a good reminder out there for people out there. Don't rely on a third party block explorer. There, there's, you know, if you're running your own node and you have the ability then to perform searches locally. You could control the data and you could limit what information gets sent out, which is very key. But in the end, it just goes to show you there's some interesting things moving going on here because if you're looking at this story, this Google blockchain search uh, story, it's very interesting because Google, not too long ago, didn't want even advertising about Bitcoin at all. Mm -hmm. The times are changing. So if you read between the lines, it looks like they're getting more cozy with Bitcoin, but they're doing this also, I guess, to try to, who's Google? What are they known for? Getting yeah, information. Exactly. And this is another way to get information. So I would strongly suggest people out there, if you're going to use this, just do it for fun. Never use any of your transactions. Try to find a transaction that is publicly known, like anything. And just I don't want to say what, just anything and search those for fun. Don't use your own. Search on your node. You'll be good. Look up the uh, Coinbase wallets. That's it. I, yeah. I just, think, I just think that like the there's a huge, maybe not a huge, but there's some subsection of people like the the engagement farmers on Twitter who are always like, oh man, look at this. Google's actually donating, donating, giving resources to you know Bitcoin related stuff. You know what they probably did is just copy some kind of open API. Like this mempool that space. Um, have an API you can use? Like, can you just pull their API and use it on your website or whatever? I wonder if you can or not. Because maybe they, you can, maybe you maybe you can't. But at the end of the day, like Google could have just done something like that and just worked into the search. It wouldn't take much to do. They that, give you, you the know? source code for free, but Mempool yeah. gives you the source code for free. And it, with terms of, um, I forget the term, but in terms of getting everything and putting it on a database, that you have different options. You could use a elect RS. Uh, the right. Rest, right, Electrum Rust. Server. Electrum, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's lots of different options, and it's all freely available, open source. So anybody, so it wasn't that hard for them to do it. Basically, is what I'm saying. Right, right. They yeah. they could do yeah. it. And they could just manipulate it for how they want. Absolutely. So yeah, this is not something special. The information is there, and they have the people in house to do whatever they want. For right? sure, they for sure. A, yeah, 100%. an army of of people. Yeah, you, you're 100 right. Sorry, I didn't want to derail this too much. No, no, that's all. That's all I wanted to add. There's not much to say about that, except to your point. Um, I'm glad you said it. Don't search. For addresses that belong to you or transactions that are related to you in Google's search bar, don't don't search for them at all. Like, don't look at them. If you're looking for a transaction, like, use something else. Okay, go to Tor or whatever. But uh, I wouldn't be doing it on anything ClearNet because over time, it, much like every Instagram ad you see, you're like, damn, I wouldn't mind actually buying that. Uh, you're gonna be tied to a lot of Bitcoin stuff before you know it too. So. You have to assume that um, everything you type in is recorded and pinned to you. And I think that's probably the case. Like you mentioned, Aylan, that's their business model almost at this point. I don't think that's up for debate. So don't don't play the game, man. Don't don't be tempted. It's just a stupid little feature. It's nothing special. It's nothing you haven't seen before. There's no need for you to try it. Yeah, you are the product, right? When you're offering something for free and all you have to do is just sign up and give nothing else, yeah. how are they making money? How are they <laughs> able to provide this service? Certainly through ads, but... Also, it's the gathering of information and selling of that information. And if they're gathering this information related to your transactions, I don't want to go too, into too much into this. We <laughs> talked about it. But anyways, uh, Antminer, it's the last story I have. They sure. announced the new S21 Pro, and they did this at the Global Digital Mining Summit 2024. I think that was held in Oman, if I recall correctly. The S21 Pro, pretty good specs here. Out of the box, 234 terahash. 15 joules per terahash. So you only need four of these bad boys to get to one Holy terahash. Holy shit. Is incredible. This is 
two times the hash rate of the S19 Pro. And it's a great piece of equipment to deal with with the upcoming halving, right? Like if you I think bet. about it, this is an absolute just perfect plug and play. Now, there's going to be a lot of electricity that comes along with it. But still, it just goes to show you that there is more that they could squeeze out of this. And as for comparison, the S20, sorry, S21, sorry, s the non-pro version, has a hash rate of 200 terahash per second and a power consumption ratio of 17.5 joules per terahash. So comparing the two, the S21 and the S21 Pro, 17% more hash rate from the Pro, 14% more efficient. And this, the, seven, the S21 was only launched seven months ago. Seven months later, we have something now with 17% starting, more efficient starting to go hash faster. Rate. Yeah. Lots of R&D went into this. <laughs> Let's be honest. They probably put a crap load into this. But also, on top of everything I've mentioned here, Bitmain is claiming that these rigs could handle ambient temperatures up to 45 Celsius. Wow. So this may be a perfect contender and a fit for those energy-rich Middle East countries that have can to be with high Can you name one? Do you have any in mind? <laughs> Oman, man. They were just in Oman to do this. So like, why not them? Like, Qatar, yeah. Qatar yeah. sorry. Yeah, it's Pretty crazy. wild, man. That's, that's like, I mean, I don't know if you've done the roundup, but just the yeah. speed yeah. that these guys are coming out with new tech in mining. And I know that these are quote unquote industrial units, but Len, like, you know, you're like three years away from being able to put this in your home basically for, I don't know what, three, three, three thousand bucks. Probably what will the, what will these things go for in three years before the end of the next epoch? You're talking seven months unit to unit here. Um, it's, it's wild. Like it is wild. And, and it's, it's happening. You know, we, it's not like this is unexpected. You see this everywhere, whether it's computers or cell phones or you know like you and i play video games land like the playstation 5 now if sony says it's in its it's in its end of life cycle the thing's been out for what four years maybe the ps4 was in november it came out the ps4 was a decade this thing's four years they say it's like getting near its end of life but they're and gonna so, do the pro next yeah but the, yeah but the, it's only gonna be the pros only a two-year thing it's not it's so even if they go th three more years it's still only 65 or 66 percent right of what it was the previous cycle and quicker and quicker and quicker. You're seeing it everywhere. Absolutely, yeah. Mining is going to be no different. The, now here's the question for you. What's this mean for the industrial guys? Do they start to, and this is a favorite topic of Bitcoiners, right? If you know that something is going to be cheaper in the future, do you delay the purchase? I don't know what you do now because you can't get enough rigs for an industrial operation and then say, and then have the manufacturer say to you in seven months, by the way, these are a generation old now. I, I don't know what you do. I, I'm not sure what the what the fix is for that or what the outcomes are going to be here as far as the those operations, right? It's interesting because you you know you got to get financing, you got to find power, you got to do all these things. It's a huge ask. You would like to have the things running for a year, eighteen months. I don't know what the what the cycle is, but I, it can't be seven months. Seven months is like nothing. So I, I don't know what they're going to do, but this is it's cool news all the same. Like I love seeing this kind of firepower come online. It's good for the network. It's good for the price, but for miners, industrial miners, like it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a tough struggle. game. It's, it's, it's cutthroat. Yeah. Cut 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 I, I don't think they're going to be in a process if they ordered a bunch of S21s to start upgrading them and replacing them with the pros because they, they knew full well once they got S21s, there's going to be another edition coming out. Look at the S19, how many different versions? I know, the like, I know. So yeah. it's on and on and on. So I, the same is probably going to happen with the S21s. It just There's going to be a, a number of different options available for consumers. And for those that are in industrial mining, man, I don't know how they're going to be able to move forward. They got the halving coming up. The price of Bitcoin is really high. But also another thing is debt. If they have to take on debt to buy stuff, that ain't cheap. They might be able to get some favorable terms. Like it's, yeah, but it's hard. Yeah, but it's hard to take debt now because in the last cycle, I mean, you and me talked about this when we were doing more minor content and you were especially doing minor content. What were they using to get the debt? They collateralized their equipment or the rigs, they, the rigs. Yeah. Exactly. And you, no one or is giving course. debt on that now. No one's going to give you debt on rigs anymore. That those that ship has sailed. So I don't, I don't know how they're even going to raise debt now besides, you know, issuing equity. But that, that's not dilution or yeah. just going out and say, I need X amount of dollars. Okay, we give you these terms. But again, like because everything is more expensive, so that is especially yeah. These guys are tough, and on top of all that, now and I've been theorizing this for a while. I think we've been theorizing this for a while. The oil and gas getting involved, yeah, they have a lot of capital they could draw upon, 
and they don't have to seek energy for the most part yeah. is if they have energy that's just being wasted just it is, not, yeah is that right it's, it's that's just one checkbox that you don't have to deal with and it's, it it's it's hmm. something and the other thing too i wrote this in the research roundup for people who didn't read it but this week and for the rest of the quarter it's actually this week and 45 days following today you start to see 13 apps come out and, and you find out who's been buying the bitcoin etfs and it's this is important as, because the, of the point you just made one of the things we've heard over and over and over again from guys who are in the mining space from guys who are uh in the finance space sb comes to mind and everyone we've talked to about publicly traded miners and why energy companies don't get in what's the thing we always hear career risk it's too much to ask somebody who's sitting pretty in the c-suite to say we should be going into mining and spend you know 10 billion on a huge uh swarm of s19 j pros or whatever or whatever ones you just said s21s um and 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 have the board kick you back and then start a group chat without you <laughs> and, and and eliminate you from your c-suite spot but as the 13 f's come out you're gonna find out which kind of big money operations and entities are buying these ets and that lowers the career risk for the first time now you're gonna have a lot of financials that weren't available to you uh, you know as recently as a week ago and you're gonna be able to see who's buying and so now guys at exxon can take this to their board and say, look, look at the companies that are buying this thing. It's not going away. Here's what the miners are doing. They're going to have trouble getting debt. This is the time to strike before everyone realizes this. And you're going to start, I think you're going to start seeing vertical integration and it's going to be fucking wild, man. Now the other question, Len, is, and you and me, you know, have us, I think we have a sweet spot for this and, and an agreement on this. How does this infect, infect, how does this affect industrial mining operations that exist today and is it better to have centralized mining operations like hut or riot or marathon that can be a target of governments or is it better to have companies who really like is like exxon is damn near an arm of the government already do you want them um, excuse me doing mining and oil and gas and energy and like do you want them doing all this stuff and to have everything in one one place if the government says no more uh, we want to see all the transactions. You got to censor certain blocks. You got to censor certain transactions, uh, certain addresses. We don't want. We want to know who's pointing hash toward you guys. We want. We want. We want. What's better, the industrial miners or having oil and gas in there? I don't know. The best sure. solution is to have more people mining in their garage. But for now, we're so far away from that. It feels like it's it's not good. And it's like it's like kind of a devil you know situation. I think I'd rather have the little industrial miners. Uh, like the huts and marathons than I would, uh, you know, Suncor <laughs> firing up 5 billion in, in Alberta for, for a fucking Bitcoin mine. I think anyway, I don't know. It's just a weird thing to consider. It's There's going to be a, a lot of transition moving forward on the mining side of things. And yeah, if you could do some garage mining if, or even heat your home in the wintertime, consider doing so. But of course, it may be more cost effective for you just to simply buy Bitcoin. And um, so it's really depending on how you want to move forward. But either way, that's it for the Bitcoin related stuff. Joe. I'm not sure if you have any stories that I missed that you want to talk about, but now's a chance to bring it up. No, nothing comes to mind. Uh, I'm sure we'll hit some fun notables if I had to guess. So we may as well hop over there. So if you're on video with us on YouTube, or I guess if you're on Twitter spaces, you can hang in here and uh, we're going to keep going. And if you're listening on the podcast uh, release on Tuesday morning, you will get the rest of this tomorrow, Wednesday morning. So uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you then. Yeah, take care and don't be a cock. 5821. Okay, where do you want to go here? We got uh, another hour no, or so. I guess quite a few stories. Actually. Yeah, what do you think? Okay, we'll start off with a very notable story, Swift. <laughs> and they are moving ahead, looks like, with a CBDC. And it's something that is going to be rolled out, they're saying, within the next one to two years. And Reuters is reporting on this, that they've recently concluded a six-month trial and this trial involved 38 different members and their central banks. The countries that were involved were Germany, France, Australia, Singapore, Czech Republic, Thailand, and a bunch of others that want to be unnamed, which is interesting. But Singapore, the Singapore dollar, are they going to make that into a CBDC one day? Hopefully not, because it's one of our, it's a fan favorite of the show. <laughs> So with this, they're saying that this is going to be, or this has been one of the largest collaborations, global collaborations on CBDCs. And also this is the larger, largest collaboration for tokenization of assets to date. And some of the big banks that were involved were HSBC, Citibank, 
Deutsche Bank, and a bunch of others. So it's not just simply the central banks in their countries that were involved. Also, they had a lot of these big banks, massive banks that were involved in this trial as well. So the goal they're going to be moving forward is to determine how they could handle highly complex trades to help automate them, speed up, and reduce the cost of settlements. And this wouldn't be unprecedented, right? Because if you're talking about a CBDC, the Bahamas, Nigeria, and China already have in some way, shape, or form a CBDC that they have rolled out. And also the European Central Bank, they've hinted that they're working on a digital currency. So there's a lot of talk behind the scenes and there are already countries that have moved ahead with stuff. So the real hurdle to see if this is going to be successful is with the multiple central banks that are being involved, can they deal with different underlying technologies with CBDCs? That's the thing that they're going to have to look at. But if you have one common protocol and all these other central banks could connect to this protocol through an API or something like that, well, then potentially you could have even different CBDC systems connect to it and work from there. Very technical. I, I would imagine that I have zero ability to even figure this out, but there are people that are much smarter than me looking at this, but this is not a retail CBDC. This is on a wholesale CBDC. So they're doing this right now. And I know you, you're very, you've talked you know about what it You know what I'm going to say. Tell me what I'm going to say to you when I get my chance to speak. Go ahead. Well, you've been talking about a CBDC that's going to be rolled up for some time. And you, you think you and I were on the same side of the fence, but we have different opinions on when this is going to be rolled out. I think a retail CBDC is a long time away. I think you believe it's much closer than what I think it is. And so looking at this, does this feed your opinion that feed into your opinion? Yeah. That's probably going to come sooner rather than later. What do you think? I think so. I mean, this my, is probably... my, my only question for you is going to be, does this change your opinion on the time horizon? Because I look at no, this and I just think it's it's like it's almost here. It's closer than everyone realizes. Yeah, it's still very far away. Again, a retail CBDC, something that you and I can transact with, <laughs> I think is very far away. Something on a wholesale, this has always been the hurdles. So first done this, and then you can move on to something a little bit less, and then eventually it'll be retail. And we're still, it's not going to be two, three, or five years away. It's probably going to be a decade or longer. In my you opinion. think a decade? A decade. For the U.S., absolutely. I think other central banks could do it sooner, and I'm talking about the U.S. I think the U.S. is probably the last central bank that is going to go ahead with a CBDC. I think huh. that others, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, a whole bunch of others will probably go first. Why not? I think they the, algorithm, be the, ghetto ground, is, so the algorithm ghetto is calling you, buddy. It's coming faster than you think. And and in the chat, people are saying the same thing. I, I, I Listen, the question I think me and you haven't really dove deep on, and maybe we can in the summertime, we have like a gap in a week. What is What exactly is a CBDC? How does it work? What does it look like? And maybe most importantly, how far is it from what we're using today? That's a question that remains, I think, a little bit gray, not just for us, but for a lot of people. CBDC is this, this term that's thrown around a lot because it's clickbaity and it's sexy on Twitter. But broadly, it's hard to define what these things are. Everyone kind of agrees that it's a thing. That, I can. Can you? Okay, yeah, go. If, yeah. if okay. there's proof of authority, there's one central entity, maybe a few other backups regionally. That's what it is. So if it's a programmable uh, currency that uses proof of authority, that's it. And it's associated with a central bank. Yeah. It can't be some tr true shitcoin that has absolutely no associated with a country. Association right. with the country. Right, right. Okay. So that, that's that's my definition of it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I still think we're closer than a lot of people realize, honestly. And I, you know, I, I just think this, the, if the best case that can be made for a CBDC being further away than closer is that there's not the technical wherewithal and competence in governments to roll this thing out without problems. I, I just don't think that's enough. I don't think I don't think that's a, that's a good enough case to to say that it's far away, um, because governments, you know, as we know, will outsource to competent groups for something like this, and definitely have competent people at some of the highest levels doing things that are actually important, as opposed to stuff like I don't know you know, running the White House Twitter account or whatever goes on over there. But like generally the stuff that matters gets gets competent eyes and hands and ears. And uh, this is important. And, you know, the other thing too that I think people are forgetting is he, there's a clear sh shift starting toward balkanization and unrest broadly in the United States. And uh, I don't think that 
the states is going to be the last federal government to roll one out. I think it'll be among the first, quite honestly. The question of use and adoption is a different story, but the option will be there in the states, I think, among the first available, not not among the last. They'll be they'll be near the front of the line. So will we. Yeah, I think we'll I think yeah, we'll be near the front of the line too. We're on the opposite end of the spectrum here. I mean, I'm just of the opinion it's going to be, and I don't want to see, I'm, I'm not talking about just like a pilot project or some regional, just where a few people, I'm talking like a full fledged, full rolled out CBDC. That's why, that's what I'm talking about 10 years away. Just like we had a, a pilot project for UBI in Ontario and three select cities. Okay. So say, yeah, UBI exists. I mean, not, no, not to, yeah, not to like drag this topic on, but like, I think we're, we're really working around the edges. Like, a full what is what is it what do you mean by full rollout like people either use it or they don't use it like bitcoin is a full rollout now but not everyone uses it so you know is is bitcoin out there you know is that a that's that's what i'm trying to say like i, I think that there's a when chance they give to people the it. option to use it yeah and they could choose one or the other or they're forced to use it rather than choosing one of the, i think choosing one of the Iowa. other yeah the option, and if you live outside of Iowa, you're not going to be able to use it because we like want in to Canada, control. everyone can use it except Quebec. That's like the, always the story. Everyone gets it except Quebec. I, so <laughs> in that case, I would say it's fully much rolled out. Because, yeah, yeah. But on the flip side, if they say just PEI can use it, I mean, yeah, it's rolled out, but really, I mean, Lagar it's not. Lagarde gives these stupid fucking speeches. I can't. I can never tell when they're from because she's looked like she's a thousand years old for five years. About, she's got a nice tan, so she's always like tanned. She the, she do I don't know be, how she does it though. She she, she do she do be enjoying the UV rays. Uh, you think that's does that turn you orange? Does she, she have looks, an orange? She tip? looks kind of orange. She looks kind of orange. I would like to see Trump talk about how orange she is, actually. But I, I don't Compare think he will. skin. Yeah, I think he, I think <laughs> I would like to see him do that. If she ever took a shot at him, I have a secret opinion that the reason she doesn't talk about Trump is because she's also orange. <laughs> but anyway, um, I I think that. Uh, <laughs> I think that when she talks, like, and she's not the only one, right? She, there's other central bank authorities and and you know WEF types who are like, yeah, CBDC. Well, we're not going to eliminate cash. You're going to have the option, pleb, whether you want to use cash or CBDCs. And I just think that the option is going to be, you know, it was like the same option you had in 2021 and 2022 here when it came to, you know, certain medical interventions. Like, yeah, we didn't. You can do whatever you want whatever you want it's just gonna be a different life for you if you don't do the thing that we really want you to do and uh you know but the option is there i think that's i think that's where you're gonna land on cbdc's honestly and um, time yeah i know we got it we got it in our bet book here we'll bet that on the fourth year anniversary well i'm saying it's gonna be in our 13th year anniversary or after that so if we have 13 <laughs> years and we're not there yet and then yeah sure we'll see who's one sure. anyways china they're like, I can't believe this is being done because they're going to take you back to the past, right? They're going to play the shitty bond buying games that fucking suck ass. <laughs> they're going to, this is a story from South China Morning Post. This yeah. is not sure if you saw this one. I, and also, I kind of missed the Inner Mongolia evening reports that we used to do. But anyways, the mining updates. <laughs> yeah, we got some more about Inner Mongolia. China is desperate, or they are desperately in a need for an infusion of cash to enter the markets. So liquidity is what they're dying for right now. So what's the gameplay they're going to use? Wow. <laughs> the tried, tested, and true central bank bond buying play, right? Let's this do it. Let's this do thing it. works all the fucking time. So they're going to dust off this playbook, right? And this, in China at least, hasn't been used in approximately two decades. So for their credit, in their credit, they haven't been doing this like others have. But it looks like this move was announced at the Central Finance Work Con Work Conference. This was done back in October of last year. Mm -hmm. Some time has passed since then, and people have noted that the Chinese central bank has yet to start the buying program, bond buying program, which seems odd because they announced it last year in October, day before Halloween, and still to date we're April and they haven't yet done it. But anyways, the CCP goal is to grow China's economy by five percent in 2024, and they think that this is one way that's going to help them get there. Gone are the days of double digit growth. Remember, they used to have that all the time. Now it seems like it's just not a, no longer the case. It was case. the model, right? It was the model. Yeah. yeah. And here they are. They're like just, they're mortal, <laughs> right? And now they're going to be buying bonds. What a fucking shitty move that's going to be in the long run. Maybe it will help out temporarily in a short time, but I don't know. But again, they have their currency pegged 
to the U.S. dollar. So that's going to cause some tension somewhere. I'm not sure exactly how this is going to play out. This is well beyond my pay grade. But either way, China buying bonds, this is going to be fun to watch. They couldn't make the shift to demand economy, right? Like that was the big thing they had a problem with. They grew this thing out with the hope that it would go, you know, from a government subsidized kind of growth program and these ghost buildings would fill themselves up with people who are willing to spend money in the Chinese economy and they just couldn't do it. And now, I don't know, like what's the, what's the play? The other thing people don't talk about in terms of growth, it wasn't just double digit GDP growth they were seeing. It was population growth that was very high too. And now that's fallen off as well. It's a problem you see in all kinds of modern, um, I was going to say modern democracies. Let's say it, it's a problem you see more and more in the first world that uh, fertility rates are way down. And it's because people are accustomed to a certain style of living, a certain standard of, you know, a certain standard of life. Like your weekend looks a certain way, your weeknights and mornings look a certain way. You enjoy that style. And so you don't want to leave it. And, you know, that's one reason. The other reason, obviously, Len, and we've talked about this many times on CBP, is that it's too expensive to have a kid for mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know? And so people don't have their children until very late or they don't have any at all. And, uh, you know, as a result, you have less kids. And so both those metrics now have changed. It's funny, you know, I'll tell a story here. When I was in university, one of the courses I took, I was a poli sci major at Brock. And uh, people always say, oh, you walk and talk, go to Brock. But it had a strong poli sci program. A lot of, a lot of professors there did a lot of cool stuff um, in, during their careers and continue to do cool stuff. Actually, I still visit the poli sci uh, faculty page once in a while and see what people are up to. But um, one of the classes I had was this class Rise of China. And it was given by this guy, Charles Burton, who's uh, been a China stand for a long time. Um, and actually, he was married to a professor also in the faculty whose name escapes me now, went to China on assignment and came back with another wife. So, you know, they were, <laughs> he really liked China, I guess, in a lot of ways. And uh, so he, he used to say that, you know, as much as he liked the Chinese model and the Chinese kind of, you know, mixed, um, mixed democracy, he used to call it, the thing that he couldn't figure out was how they were going to sustain the growth. And people at the time, especially in the econ department, like I, I had this, um, oh God, I can't remember his name. He was a young fella talking about how the China model was the thing everyone should be looking at. It was like the way to build the third world into the first world. And it was exactly this, you know, lower taxes, uh, increase um, uh, foreign investment vis-a-vis -vis tax, re tax regimens and tax incentives and whatnot. And, uh, you know, just watch the flywheel go. And now look, you know, like it's just this this model that was revered, I think, in a lot of places, completely vanished. And, you know, it was it was as recently as uh, 2021, 2022, when a lot of the macro, global macro guys were saying, man, just wait till China comes back online. Oil's going to 150. Global demand's going to skyrocket. You know, we're going to get back to it never came back online. It never came back online. It, it never came back at the rate it was uh, clipping away at before. And so now. You got a lot of systems that are reliant on China. And you mentioned the US dollar peg. Dude, how about like iPhone production or like, like you know. They're <laughs> the doing demand. that in India right now, right? I mean, so so some they, of it. They've they moved a bunch of stuff to India. Yeah. And uh, I think that, you know, Apple's in a bit of a, a kerfuffle now with China and their government. And there's just a lot of stuff that relies on the Chinese machine. And if the machine sputters, it's going to have ripple effects, right? There's a lot of stuff that's, that's going to change or, or be affected by that. So something to keep an eye on. Now here's a question for you: If uh, if this does continue to go south for them, what what is does that increase or decrease the likelihood there's an invasion of Taiwan? That's one thing I I don't really have an answer for, but I know this is something that was very popular to discuss on Twitter Spaces and other uh, you know forums and venues you know eight nine months ago, and now it seems like no one's talking about it. But is this is this a sign of you know? a unifying uh, war between China and Taiwan, or is it a sign that this is going to disappear from, uh, from vision pretty soon? See, I never put much thought into it. I mean, so on the surface, I'm going to say that they're not going to do anything with Chi Taiwan as long as there's any perceived threat that there's going to be retaliation from the U.S. So mm -hmm. it depends on who's going to be in power in the United States. So some may say Biden is probably less likely to retaliate compared to somebody like Trump. So Depending on who wins the election, maybe they might want to consider doing it if Biden wins the next election. But then again, even with Biden there, I still think there's going to be some sort of retaliation. So it's, mm -hmm. it really depends on how weak is the U.S. is globally. But as they continue to get weaker year over year, 
they're less likely to start defending their allies. They're defending heavily right now, Ukraine, Israel. Well, weak, weaker a, means a lot of stuff, right? Weaker is including, uh, you know, the debt service um, number approaching a trillion plus, right? I'm pretty sure this year it's expected to get there. Social security wavering, sputtering, all this stuff. That right? could change this too. Once they start everywhere. lowering rates and then yeah. as new bonds get issued, so you probably have a period of time where it's going to be over a trillion, but then it's going to come back down. But it's only going to come back down temporarily. Even on low mm. rate environment, you're still going to have over a trillion dollar servicing annually for even because just because of the sheer debt that they have right now, 30, 34 trillion going to be 35 soon. It's a fucking joke. But Narwhal saying he's recommending a YouTube channel called The China Show. Is this the best education for Westerners about China? So check that out. The that China sounds, like so, sounds like something the Chinese government would say. I'll, have to, I'll look at it with a careful eye. <laughs> Well, let's move on to Notable North, Joey, because I got a few stories I want to bring up with uh, sure. this one. Because there's a story out of BC about a person who suffered a stroke and couldn't get an ambulance. I'm not sure if you saw I love, this. I, of course I saw it. It's incredible. It's, it's, it's so, absolutely insane. It's a CTV news story. And some guy was near Richmond, BC, and he, he was going to go pick up his parents at the airport. So his parents were flying in from somewhere. It doesn't say where. But anyways... As he was driving to the airport to get his parents, unfortunately, he suffered a stroke. And even with that, he was still able to somehow pull the car over to the safety of the side of the road, even though he was starting to lose the use of his limbs. And somehow he was able to call 911 and call for an ambulance to come get him because he was there stuck on the side of the road, unable to do anything, suffering a stroke. It's a bad situation to be in. So Buddy waited a long time um, for an ambulance. In fact, so long that... They actually called him back an hour later, the 911 people did, and they advised him there's going to be no ambulance coming. And he has to, they advised him to drive himself to the hospital. Insane. And through the whole ordeal, he managed to get to the hospital somehow. But the article didn't exactly say how. But anyways, uh, upon arrival at the hospital too, he then waited and waited and waited and didn't get medication for over 24 hours after initially suffering a stroke, which from what I understand could be really problematic you have to get medication right away you have to treat it and then hopefully you'll be able to recover but this guy he got the worst of all ends he wasn't unable to get an ambulance they told him to drive himself to the to the hospital then he got to the hospital somehow and he had to wait for hours on end and so, still somehow can you, ima can, you imagine, can you imagine being that like i mean i hope neither of us are in that situation but could you imagine that happening to you i would lose my no fucking mind. lose my fucking mind but you, you, you know what? I don't even think you'd be losing your mind because you're probably you're probably disoriented. You're confused. When no, you're but like after stroke. after Len, well, like I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be going to the late. news and I'd be like out in front of the hospital with a fucking megaphone. Like this is insane. It's insane. Yeah. This guy. Oh. There, there are ways to say this that are, you know, a little more genteel than what I'm about to say. But like. How how is it fair that this guy pays into the system for his whole life or like, you know, his whole adult life? And when he has a problem finally, he gets a call that says there's no ambulance coming. Fucking crazy. Fucking crazy. When politicians say that it's unfair to call the Canadian system broken, this is what Canadians are talking about. Broken isn't a strong enough word for what happened to this guy. It's not a strong enough word for parents and and you know their babies have to wait in the emergency room with high fevers for six hours it's not a strong enough word for people who go to the hospital to get treatment for you know a significant injury and get misdiagnosed and sent home it's not a strong enough word for any of these things and you know what what, what can we what can we do about this that will have a, an effect what will have a positive effect in the short or medium term Maybe the most frustrating thing and maybe the most frustrating answer, the answer is nothing. There's nothing we can do. There's too many people. There's not enough doctors. There's not enough supports. And the answer, Len, is going to wind up being we need to pay more tax and the service is going to get worse and more expensive like every other fucking time we do this. And uh, I don't know what the fix is, man, especially in some of these like more difficult to reach communities. Like I think about if you were going up north or uh, if you were at the cottage or something, you know, how... How how do you how do you tell people that like sorry I know you've been paying into the system forever sorry I know you've been a good you know contributor to the CPP or whatever sorry 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 but 
we just don't have the resources for you. So hopefully you don't die uh, either of the stroke or on your way to the hospital driving with one arm and your you know body slumped over to one side. But uh, we can't do anything for you. Like what were they? What were they hoping? Honestly, that the guy just wouldn't get there and they wouldn't have to worry about it. And then he shows up and they're like, "Oh fuck, he made it." Well, we still don't have anything for him. I guess let's just sit him in the waiting room. Could you imagine showing? Thought of the, Len, far ahead, could you yeah. imagine showing up in the waiting room? Right? You show up in the waiting room. You got a broken ankle or something. You're playing basketball. You broke your ankle. You show up in the waiting room. There's a guy having a fucking stroke in the waiting room. How long have you been waiting, buddy? Oh, I don't know, four hours. Could you fucking imagine? It's like a fucking SNL skit. It's it's in, it's completely insane. We should be ashamed. People from that hospital should be fired. There should be review of the books. It should be like it should be like a, a napalm the entire institution situation and just salt it and start again. But it's not gonna be any of that. There's not gonna be any repercussions, no. it's not gonna be any consequences, it's gonna be nothing. We're just carry on like nothing happened. Yeah. And it's it's gonna cost people more money to try to rectify it because if you look at I could speak about the province of Ontario. I can't speak about other provinces. From what I understand in Ontario, the two biggest line items on the Ontario budget are education and healthcare. And that takes up education. Know, somewhere are we are we gonna talk about the fucking TikTok thing today? The teachers suing TikTok and Meta? we can if you want. I, want. I think we should. I think we should. <laughs> but anyway. You want to talk about it right now because since you brought oh, it up. Oh man, so sure. it, it's just Ontario schools they're going through the yeah. process. And it's it's a select school boards, one in on Ottawa, I believe, and mm -hmm. two in Toronto, they're going to be moving ahead with going up against TikTok, Meta, and Snapchat because they're suing all three of them to the tune of four point five billion dollars. So those school boards are doing this because they claim that they're disrupting student learning and also the education system. Good luck. <laughs> I, I don't know how they came up with this $4.5 billion. And even if they win, what are they going to be doing with that? Because the kids, they're, you know, they're already being disrupted, just not just because of that, but because of a whole bunch of other things too. Society is, is also making them be disrupted as well. But I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I'm not sure what you want to add to this, but there you go. That's, I laid out the carpet here as much as I can for you. Well, I'll start with a question. You have a young daughter. Uh, do you consider your young daughter to be placed into a bad situation in terms of her education by her cell phone use? No, she doesn't have a cell phone too. Of course she doesn't have a fucking cell phone, Len. She's a kid. And whose decision was it not to give her a cell phone? Well, obviously the parents. It was your decision. Okay, you and your wife made that decision. Now let's just shift this a little bit, okay, to the to the school setting. I had this uh, disagreement with uh, Milan. I can't remember his last name, but he's, he, he's a guy. I actually like him. He's a uh, middle school teacher, it sounds like, on Twitter. Lucic? Milan no, Lucic? no, no. It wasn't, it wasn't Milan Lucic, former NHL. Former middle league NHL talent. No, it wasn't him. Uh, you know, and I, I put out this tweet that like the the school boards and the unions continue to go down this road where they just delivered the shittiest piss poor results on any measurable metric that exists today. And they blame everybody but themselves, right? They blame everyone else. It's a, it's always something else. It's uh, you know, right wing extremism, it's homophobia, it's racism, it's what it's not, guys. It's that you fucking suck at your fucking jobs. It's that all of you are fucking losers. You all took teaching on as a profession as a fucking plan B, and it shows. You want to be revered everywhere from the liquor store line to the cocktail parties to the church, but none of you take the fucking job seriously enough. Joey, how do you know this? Let me fucking tell you. If you were serious about making sure that phones didn't disrupt learning, what would you do? You'd ban the fucking phones from the classroom. You'd ban them. No more fucking phone. Put it in a Faraday bag at the door. Leave it in your locker. Leave it in your backpack. You get 10 minutes for your phone in the morning, 10 minutes for your phone in the afternoon. That's it. There's always a better way to solve things that these guys refuse to do. Why? Because they don't want to engage with parents. They don't want to engage with teachers. And Lynn, I hate to say it, but it sounds to me like these people who are professionals demanding to be paid six figures can't engage with fucking children either. They can't do it. They're unwilling to have these difficult conversations and deal with difficult uh, classrooms, kids, teachers, parents, whatever. It's, it's just these people are not serious. They're not serious. And so I will repeat something I've said on the show before. When you ask yourself, who's going to pay my CPP in 15 or 20 years? How can you, as a, a rational person, think 
that any of these kids taught by any of these teachers have a fucking hope in hell of paying CPP for a country of 50 fucking million people in 15 years. Do you really think that that's possible? You can't. You, you can't. No one with a sound mind thinks that's possible. These teachers unions are a plague on society. They are a plague on kids. They are the worst thing for education. And they are trying to get away from every shred of accountability left to evaluate their performance. Instead, they bloat the curriculum with nonsense that has no effect on the productive capacity of these kids going forward. Why? Because it's easier. It's low-hanging fruit. That's what they want. I'm not willing to entertain any other argument at this point. What else can you say? You refuse to take phones out of classrooms. Instead, you sue the fucking companies. You guys are, it's so stupid, Len. It is so fucking stupid. I, I, I want to give you a chance to answer a couple of questions. And since you're a parent and I'm not a parent, if your school told you in a newsletter or whatever, that from now on, phones are going to be Faraday bagged when the kids arrive in the morning. And if you need to get a hold of your son or daughter, you should call the school and you'll be able to speak to them through the office, uh, you know, in the office setting or whatever. Would that bother you as a parent? No. It's no. just like the old days. That's how it was done when I was of growing up. Of course and not. And if, you're, if your son or daughter was using a phone and in, in a setting that Faraday bags were not being used or whatever, and the teacher sent home a note saying, yeah, I had to take your kid's phone. It's, it's going to be in my desk for the rest of the week. If you need it, I'll give it to you. But please make sure that the child doesn't bring the phone to the classroom anymore. Would that upset you? No. Is that a reasonable thing to ask a fucking professional who gets paid six figures and wants to be revered at liquor store lines and cocktail parties for their calling to education? Is that too much for that person to be asked to do, you think? I Is it? I think that's well within it's their duties. Fucking if they ever not, to do it. It's fucking not. And yet they refuse to fucking do it. These school boards. So, yeah, who's, like this now, devil's advocate. Now, if they're not told to do it, why should they do it? So somebody, okay. let's be honest. Of course here. they're not told to do it. Of course they're not told to do it because the school boards don't want to engage with parents. They don't want to have any difficult conversations. They don't want to have any fucking fights. It's it's stupid. These people are not serious. They're fucking kids. They're they're like so immature. They're, they're immature. They're clowns. doing a job. The teachers are doing a job, and you know it's not a calling. It's a job, right? And so they're gonna do hopefully what they're instructed to, to do. The school board, oh their administrator superintendent whoever tells them this is what this is the thing you gotta do and you gotta do that right they're, they're just lemmings right this is, in, in a way this is now, exactly they, they can why. take a little bit outside the box yeah but this should be directed from above more this than anything is, this is exactly why i didn't follow through on a in a career a, a prof, my teaching career i just i can't do it i cannot be around these people they're not serious they pretend they're uh you know on a mission from god working in the classroom um they will have you believe they have the and like, I'm not, I'm not talking about every teacher. Okay. Like I said to Milan, I'm, I'm not talking about every teacher. There are really competent, really high quality teachers, but they're so deluded now, both by the piss poor quality of their colleagues and the piss poor quality of the curriculum that no matter how hard they try, they're just not going to be able to deliver a good product. Period. End of story. And the school board should be ashamed of themselves. Again, second the time. That yeah, they, second time they, in they, Notable North here. Like napalm and salt the earth and start again with, with all this stuff. Just get rid of all these fucking people now before it's too late. Because in 15 years, when these 10-year-olds are trying to get jobs, okay, wh again, what is the plan to have them pay into the CPP? What is the plan? What, what is me, the plan I'll be to have them pay into healthcare or with fun roads? Tacos. Whatever, right? Like they, like they just can't, you can't, there's no way... If you can't even get these kids off their phones when they're fucking 10, what is the plan to have them contribute to the tax base to keep the country running in 15 years? UBI, baby. UBI. Fucking whatever. What's next? Right. Let's go on. We'll talk about another CTV story. It was a woman in Ottawa. She is 75 years old. And she's been a customer of BMO for a long time because this story goes back to September 2022 where she received a call from somebody claiming to be on behalf of Amazon Prime. And they were telling her that she needs to update her payment method. And she never used Amazon Prime before, so she became suspicious. She did the right thing. She actually turned off her computer, went to the bank and tell them what happened. That She did right. very proactive here. 
And the bank, what they did, they issued her a new debit card and credit card, new pins, the whole nine yard. And she was reassured that her money was not at risk. Until sometime later, she realized that someone gained access to her, her account, stealing $11,000 from her savings and also $4,000 from her credit card. And mm. the money they tracked it, it went overseas using BMO's global money transfer. She went back to the bank, asked why this wasn't flagged initially. The, bl- the bank then launched an investigation and a final decision was reached. What was it? Well, she's not to receive any compensation because the bank found she did not adequately protect her account information. This is a good story about Bitcoin. So exactly how the scammers gained access to her account has not been conclusively explained, but the bank said there's no way that the fraudulent transaction could have happened without her bank card number, password, and the one-time pass codes. She went to the ombudsman for banking services, complained, and according to the ombudsman, in 2023 alone, there were 2,700 banking consumer banking complaints of various types. More than half come from BMO. So there, <laughs> there is, and in 2022, so basically in 2023 they had 1,400 ish or so complaints. In 2022, they only had 331 complaints. So that's a huge spike yeah. from BMO in just one year. So this is another example why you Bitcoin. You control your keys. You control your passphrase if you have one. You're going to control your Bitcoin. You're not relying on some centralized authority that if you get rugged and you ask them to be made whole, they have the final say if indeed that you are going to be made whole or not. So feel sorry for this lady. She ended up moving all her business after decades of being with BMO to another bank because she's so pissed off with them. And I can understand why she's out 15 grand and yeah. it's not going to make her whole. Like, this is shitty service. But there you go. A story from CTV News. Just more and more fuel for the fire. Why we Bitcoin? Isn't it funny that people who don't like Bitcoin are like, well, what happens if someone steals your Bitcoin? Who's You can't call anyone. You just lose it. You're not going to get it back. Guess what? <laughs> Boy, do I have a story for you. <laughs> you can't, can't get your money back from the bank either. Even after you warn them that something happened, they still won't give you your money back. They still let you get scammed. I, I think it's hilarious, man. I don't know. Poor, poor woman, but... Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, a story as old as time at this point. It's going to get worse and worse, man. Banks are not exempt from the crisis of competence that we are seeing everywhere. And uh, you're going to see it more and more in that sector because it's it's like a trusted sort of uh, black box, right? You just assume that the money's in the bank and it's good. And if you get, if you get scammed or you get hacked, they got your back. But it turns out that uh, they don't have your back and the uh, black box shouldn't be trusted after all. So be aware, be aware, take your money out, <laughs> put it in a shoe box. The interest rate's pretty low on your savings account. Anyway. <laughs> You're better off putting it under your bed. No one-time passwords under there. Bank of Canada, the deputy governor, Carolyn Rogers, was talking publicly about Canada's productivity and low business investment. You wrote about this. Yeah. On the, so you're very familiar with this. I'll just... Laid out for you. She even used the word saying, I'm saying that this it's an emergency and it's time to break the glass. This is straight from the deputy governor's mouth. She also says what really sticks out is how much we lag on investment in machine machinery, equipment, and other important intellectual property. She's citing info from StatsCan, which shows that labor productivity in Canada's Canadian businesses rose a mere 0.4% in Q4 2023. Yep. This on the surface doesn't say a whole lot, but coupled with the fact that numbers fell for six straight quarters before that, well, the annual productivity declined 1.8% <laughs> in 2023. That is the third consecutive year of decline. This is the measure of how much the economy produced against how many hours are being worked. Because it's funny, there's a lot of people out there, they're pointing to GDP as a finger figure that things are trending in the right direction. But that is simply just one metric. Another one, maybe equally as important, I'm not sure, but is GDP per capita, which has been for a few years now falling behind the United States. And the Bank of Canada says that the lack of production is making it more difficult for them to tackle the rising costs. Yes, sir. And they're saying, they're asking that businesses try, if they can, to invest more capital to help turn this thing around. They're saying back in 1984, the Canadian economy was producing 88% of the value generated by the U.S. economy per hour. But by 2022, this has fallen to 71%. That's 17% drop from 84. That's two years ago. Two years ago, by the way. So what is it now? She, does, she, doesn't, she doesn't mention it, but it's got to be lower now. Yep. 
Yeah. And so they're saying that Canada's fallen behind also their G7 peers. So in comparison to your counterparts, it's going worse. It's getting worse and worse. So there you go. I, I set this table for you, Joey. I know that you, this is a topic you know a little bit more than I do, I think. So yeah, enjoy. She she makes the case um, that the productivity issues are based around investment. She's right. So to your point, the metric really is not how hard you're working in the hour that you work or that you need to work more hours. And she mentions this. The speech, by the way, is on YouTube. It's only about 40 minutes long. I didn't link it in the article that I wrote, but you, you can find it. It's not that hard to find. She, she basically makes the case that there needs to be investment in Canada to drive innovation and productivity. And she, I think, dances around a couple of things that you and me have discussed and a lot of people have discussed, including other podcasts of, you know, of great stature, like the Looney Hour or Macro Voices or uh, Bankless, Bank Bankless, probably. Yeah, <laughs> who knows? I don't know if they talk about Canadian economics, but a lot of a lot of shows with a Canadian angle or Canadian host mention this stuff. And uh, you know, Mike Mike Campbell's Money Talks, all these podcasts that are, I think, of of very high stature, um, mention this. And and she dances around a couple of things. I think two of them are more important than others. Maybe three of them actually. One is that we cannot continue to pretend that the government, that government transfer payments and the public sector should be the best or should be the biggest piece of our GDP. I don't know if you've seen that chart, Len, of Canadian GDP growth over the last quarter. You know, we talk or, about this periodically. Yeah, I mean, but it, but it's like, but the, the chart really is like it's it, damning. It stands out. It's right? damning, like, right? Because the bar for public sector is like seven or eight times the next biggest bar. And oil and gas is a, is like a very small bar, but it's actually on the left side of the uh, of the zero. <laughs> you know, like it's shr it's shrinking, right? We have all this this resource rich opportunity, and we just don't use it at all. In fact, we we choose to you know kind of dance on its grave more often than not, unfortunately. So she talks about that 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 it, it can't be government. Government is not innovation. That's just not how GDP works. The other thing she talks about is that the oligopolies that exist in the country and she doesn't talk about it directly again she dances around it you really got to read between the lines the oligopolies don't lend doesn't th that system doesn't lend itself to innovation why because it doesn't matter how dog shit your cell phone service is you can't go from rogers to bell to tell us and expect anything fucking different it's just a waste of time so you get what are you gonna do you're gonna spend three hours to get 10 bucks off your plan every month good luck man but like it's not it's not innovative and as a result, those companies don't have to increase their their product their productive capacity. They just don't have to do it. Uh, we have the worst cell phone, internet, you know, cable uh, packages in the world in this country. Um, the only countries that are worse are the ones that are on the gold machine gun index, and we're not far from that index, by the way. So that's number two. But the third one uh, is that she is saying that you know businesses are complaining that rates are too high and don't lend them. It doesn't lend itself to a an investment friendly setting and she says look you have to fix this other stuff otherwise rates can't come down because if they come down this problem is only going to get worse and if it gets worse it's going to be harder to get out of and she's basically saying like look the immigration thing is not working okay the oligopoly thing is not working the government spending thing is not working we need real productive capacity increases and what we're doing is setting us back a decade at this point and uh you know the g7 I think at the bottom of that seven land is basically anything but but uh, G. So like I I don't I don't understand how like you know we should be comparing ourselves to Italy and we're like yeah but we're still like on par with some of the countries in the G seven like the G seven is not a real thing anymore. Um, it's like sort of a you know great countries in name only and um, I don't know I I I I highly recommend people watch the talk. There's a reason people like Carolyn Rogers. She's a little more animated than Macklem is and speaks her mind a little more than Macklem does. And uh, I, you know, I think she's great. I honestly do. I, I really enjoyed the speech. She's honest and I think she's right. Uh, most importantly. All right. Did you see that Canada looks like they're going to be moving ahead with rental payments counting towards credit score. I, I this came up at my Easter dinner yesterday. Yeah. Ta hmm. Talk to me about this. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea behind this is this is going to help build credit score for to enable people to qualify for mortgages and other loans. Mm -hmm. Because right now, people that pay rent, that isn't captured on your credit score. So people, oh, we'll talk about it in a second. So the PM is saying that there is something fundamentally unfair about paying rent. 
um, something like two thousand dollars, and this is not being captured on your credit score the same way that if you're yeah. paying a mortgage. The unfair right? is not the rent part; it's that it doesn't go toward your credit score. Exactly right. That. Yeah, yeah. And there's more than three million adults in Canada that don't have a credit score. That's almost one in ten, a little bit less than that. Mm -hmm. um, they estimate the estimate ex Equifax in 2022 reports say that a further seven million people only have limited data that the credit agency could limit their ability to access credit products. So that's ten million out of forty. So one out of every four Canadians. Yeah. I'm talking about adults here. That's going to be even, it's, it's a pretty it's damning less. number. Yeah, yeah. So they report the government of Canada is proposing a renter's bill of rights. And this is going to be used as a tool to protect renters from low vacancy rates, also high prices and other significant challenges. This all comes from the budget. That's going to be upcoming budget that they're saying it's going to be targeting younger Canadians. And this is part of the plan. Also a hot off the press is it looks like they're, they have earmarked $1 billion for um, national food, national yeah, food school program, food program for school. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it seems like this is going to be the, the the talk of the day for the budget. That's Anyways, good. the government well, teachers, teachers have lots of time to feed kids because um, they're not fucking teaching them. So that's fine. So they say the government through this will also create a $15 million fund for provincial legal aid organizations to help tenants fight landlord abuse and the quote unquote rent evictions. That's when a landlord evicts a tenant by saying that he needed to do significant renovations. But in reality, they only just rent it out shortly thereafter for a much higher price. But really, a lot of this stems to the lack of supply. So Canada just hit 41 million people in Canada. And that's an extra million people that are that in Canada in just nine months. Yeah. And in terms of the amount of housing out there it's it's not meeting the number of people coming here it wasn't there a few years ago now it's getting even worse so you have more people trying to buy for the same amount of units that are out there they're not being built so of course the price is going to be going up actually the the vacancy rate is very very low landlords are filling up their units with renters because there's more renters out there than there are units and prices going up. So this is part of the problem is there's just too many people coming into Canada with respect to how many units are being built every year. Mm -hmm. So I, I see this, man, I understand what they're trying to do, but I don't know if sure if this is going to achieve what they're trying to say they're going to achieve. It's it. I, it sucks if you're paying rent and not having this capturing your credit score. I can see that being a, like, I'm not a renter, so I'm yeah. looking at this from a different point of view, but that's probably a good thing. But is it going to help them land a mortgage? No. Probably not. Other no. loans, maybe. But what do you get from other loans? More headaches? More bankruptcies? I don't know. I mean, if it's a good loan, yeah. But how many good loans are out there that people are okay. I don't know. So I'll tell you that this is completely backwards. Um, I won't say, yeah, you know what? Fuck it. My, my dad owns some properties. And uh, he's, you know, I, he's um, d damn near cheerful about um, this new legislation. Because as we've seen over the last few years, Len, when it comes to the relationship between landlords and tenants, where are really most of the advantages at this point? They're with the tenant. Tenants are hard to evict. They can go months without paying their rent. They're oftentimes uh, in, in rent-controlled units. The province sets limits on how much rents can go up. I think that changed in 2019. So if you, if you have a unit that came online after 2019, there's different rules, but <clears throat> that's a story for another time. <clears throat> talking to uh, my dad and my uncles yesterday, they're all giddy about it because there was a time when n a person who didn't pay their rent basically suffered no consequences. If paying your rent can increase your credit score, guess what happens when you don't pay your rent? Obviously, it's going to impact your credit, your credit score fucking, negatively. It fucking nukes you. And so when the landlord decides to raise the rent uh, and you don't pay, the the damage now really is going to be significant to the future prospects of the tenant and no matter what the landlord tenant board says no matter what the tenant wants to do you know he's a little late the envelope's a little light whatever there is no coming back from that kind of credit damage if you miss payments on your rent and uh, now the landlords have this tool available to them to make sure that they have um cooperative tenants at all their properties and all their uh, you know behind all their doors and uh, again like I get what it's trying to do, but it's missing the bigger picture. 
it's, it's simply it's just simply a miss. And uh, right now it's just in you know sort of white paper phase. We'll see what it looks like in nine months. But um, you know it's it's not promising. I don't think for people who are renting. Like personally, if I was a renter and I I sort of saw this, I might you know be happy for a minute. But even the sort of <laughs> even the the people who are not as bright as they should be have to realize that if they can improve their credit score by paying, then not paying has you know the equal but opposite effect. So it's um it's a shift in power for sure. It's it shifts the balance of power between landlords and tenants in a way that I think was uh, not really considered honestly by um by the powers that be. That's it for the show, Joey. That's Third it. year anniversary wrapped it up. Hope people enjoyed it. It's in the books. It's in the books. Thanks for coming, everybody. We appreciate you guys, man. You know, um, so Wednesday, Bob Burnett coming back for like the third time in a month or something like that. How many? <laughs> no, I think like seven months or something like that. He's yeah, a good he's, guy, and, and I look great. forward to chatting with him about Donald Driver. Yeah, Driver. Ask him if he thinks Javon Walker was wasted by the by the Packers trying to stretch out Donald Driver's prime. They did wind up with Greg Jennings anyway, who turned out to be great and won a Super Bowl there, but. Um, yeah, I think I think they would have had more fun with Javon Walker. Anyway, doesn't matter. Good night, everybody. The the show. He's, what? Driver is not a Sterling Sharp, and he's damn right. He's Sterling not. Sharp for sure. Yeah. yeah. I like what, when Shannon got who, his Who was the guy? Year. Didn't the Packers have that crazy kick return guy too? What was his name? Yeah, they did. Devin Hester? Not Hester. Oh. Hester was on the Bears. Uh, before that. Before that. Someone yeah. It, it, I forget his name. But you're right. They did have one. Yeah, but I, I like when Shannon Sharp got in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. He gave his ring to um, Sterling. Really? Because he said he said in he's the only person in the Hall of Fame that's he's not the best player in a family. <laughs> you love it. The 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 humble uh, the always humble Shannon Sharp. Shannon it's Sharp is true, he's, man. He's, that guy was getting a hundred hundred receptions per year at a time where. Very few guys were getting like hey, what Jeffrey's got, and there's a few yeah. others did, but a lot he was more doing running going on back then. Yeah. And that was outdoors in Lambeau Field, right? It's yeah. like when you look at like Fran Tarkington that's going now going different time. That guy when he was throwing for four thousand yards is in a Minnesota. Season. In Minnesota outdoors, yeah. that's like uh, throwing forty thousand yards <laughs> nowadays. That was the time when run first was a big thing. <laughs> you gotta you gotta yeah. adjust for inflation. So yeah, yeah man, yeah. starting sharp. I can't wait to talk about the. But this will probably be out. out to do. It's it's oh, gonna be good. Right. It's gonna be good. So uh, yeah, we'll see you guys Wednesday, and thank you again for three years. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Yeah, don't be a cock.